Now, we don't have many traditions as a church. We don't. We have a few. But one of the traditions we have as a church is around this time, please don't think that we are money grabbers. You heard Joni come up and talk about the facts and the real reality that you have given towards these works. We don't have to do it. Look, many of you don't even know these people. I don't even see many of them. But we have chosen to stand behind the people who are doing the work. And every year, listen, we've been doing this now for 23 years. Let me just give you the facts. I'm telling you this because when I mentioned it to the Clang Church, they were like, wow! For the past, and I'm saying 23 years, we've given probably 27 years. This church, just all of us, all of you wonderful, generous, big-hearted people. But I'm saying 23 years because Shepherd Center is 23 years old. And we've taken care of that work. Pastor Jacob came to us, and you own it. He came to us just with uh, his three children and, you know, um, just beaten up, banged up in the ministry, about to quit, and said, Would, could we come under your ministry and could we be under your covering? Uh, and we want to start an orphanage. We said, all right. So 23 years ago, we said, okay. Today, they are, one of, they are considered one of the best orphanages in the country. So we are not this hand-me-out hand kind of an institution. We trust God by faith. And today, 23 years later, we've got about 15 or more buildings given to us in that orphanage. I'll just give you a rundown of, you saw all the videos, and this is not an exaggeration. Thank God for people like James and, and uh, Stefan and Yanni who have been in this church for quite a long time. But there are others who have partners with us in this giving towards, and listen, 100% of what we give in our faith pledge, 100% goes out. Nothing is kept for administration. Nothing is kept for fees or for, for salaries. Nothing. 100% in, 100% out. In fact, many times, we, your pledges didn't come through, you know, and it didn't, it didn't matter because we committed ourselves to these people. We fulfilled that commitment. So out of these 23 years, not counting seven years, this is just towards those works. Not counting seven years in a row, we've supported Thailand, 3,000 a month. So do the math. Try to think about it without no strings attached, all right? No free Thai massage or not. Just for church ministry, seven years in a row, we've given three years in a row to Philip. I almost said Philistine. The Philippines, the Philippines, three years. We helped them pay their rent, C3 Philippines, Manila, and we helped them get on their feet because they were, they, they, they were busted, so somebody came. We gave $10,000 to Africa, to a, to a church I don't even know, but I know the pastor. Imagine his name is David Livingstone. What a name. And so when they contacted us and said, Malaysia, can you help to pay? We sent over $10,000, okay? Not counting all of that, just these works for the past 23 years. I want you to listen to this and then give yourselves a big clap because you did it. For the past 23 years, let me get the facts for you clear. So I won't lie to you. 2,475,235 ringgit. The records are in the church. This is what you have given. Give yourselves a big hand. That's, you see, whenever I talk about giving, anybody can give. But not anybody can be a generous person. Generosity has got sometimes nothing to do with money, but it does involve stuff that we have. So today, allow me to just tell you that we are not in competition with any NGOs. We are working with many NGOs. We are not in competition with any other church. But we are simply very focused in our giving. And I think the best way to see results in your giving is to be focused. So we are focused. We are not giving to everybody in the whole wide world. But we are focused on these things. Now we have adopted some more people, uh, like the Orang Asli, the national... Uh, or, uh, what do you call them? You cannot call them Aboriginals. Like that's only a word for Australians. They are indigenous people. Correct, indigenous, right. So, we are focused on doing that. And let me also just say, when we started this uh, refugee school and so on, we did, again, we don't have to do this. I said to the Pakistanis, I said, guys, we are starting a school. We don't have to do it. You know, we're not getting paid by anybody, but we want to do it because you're refugees and you're on refugee status, so we want to take care of you. So I said to them, you've got to cooperate with me. You've got to work hard. I said, you've got to 
When we start something, we do it five stars. So I said, we want a five-star refugee school. Do it well. Don't waste my time with rubbish. All right? And so, so I've, I've challenged them to do that. So that's my part as a pastor to challenge people and to stir faith. Can I ask you to get on board if you have not got on board yet? Some of you have got non-Christian friends, companies, who part of their budget is to give or have donations, right? So that somehow it can show on the record that they are helping the people of Malaysia. Talk to them. You see, they don't have to be a Christian to be a generous person. They don't have to, listen, they don't have to be a Christian to be involved in our ministry. In fact, some of them, we're challenging uh, Stanley here in the men's fellowship, because we're going to be having men's breakfast and so on and so forth. And all these proceeds will go into the Orang Asli ministry. So the Empower ministry, the men's fellowship, Stanley, stand up, please. Some of them are turning and looking at... Uh, Somebody. So he's the man. So when we have our breakfasts, when we have our men's thing, all the proceeds goes towards uh, the school. So your non-Christian friends might want to jump on board. Some of them will say, well, I've got this money. Honestly, yesterday, I think the state government threw a party for all people in Klang. Bought the food, rambutans, durians, foods, everything, gifts for the kids. Because they say, we've got this X amount of money which is supposed to be given to non-Muslims. And, but we Christians, we are so shy, embarrassed, sitting down. I want to challenge some of you to get on board, talk to some of your companies and your friends and say, look, hey, we are supporting these refugees. This every month we are supporting. Would you like to come and see them? Let them come and see and buy into the vision. They don't have to be Christian. Or we are going on a trip on a road trip up into the jungles of Pahang somewhere, and we're going to support these indigenous people, and we're going to be helping them to develop uh, homes and toilets and what have you, and they're up there in the jungle with no running water, and this money goes to them. Now, we don't tell people to give by making them feel guilty. So we don't show naked pictures of children, sorry, pictures of naked children, and, you know, and their torn clothes and suffering. We don't do that because we're not trying to push you into feeling guilty in your giving. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So we don't try to do all those th things to kind of manipulate our missions. We just tell you the facts. We are going to do it. And by the grace of God. I love it. Why? Because at the end of 2018, many of you will stand back and say, I did that. I got involved with that. Praise God. Look, they're still powering on. And there are, people will get saved. People get baptized. In fact, Pastor Magesen told me they had 400 new people in that church. You saw one of those, uh, this one? Okay, those photos weren't there. And the NGO supported the whole Christmas deal. 400 he had in a carnival, Christian carnival, in a small town called Kappa. And we've been giving to that for years. Praise the Lord. So at the end of 2018, as we come to a close, like we're coming to a close in 2017, we'll stand back and say, I got involved with that. Not, uh, I did nothing. I heard about the opportunity to get involved and partner in this great adventure, but I just sat there and looked stupid. But no, I got involved. And so God has blessed me this whole year. I'll tell you what, you set yourself up to succeed in 2018 when you're serious about partnering with God. All right? When you're serious in partnering with God and the things of God, you set yourself up. So I say to you prophetically right now in the name of Jesus that you will do well in 2018, not because Pastor Joe says it, but because the Word of God says it. I'm going to be sharing with you. Hello, Hilarious. We all saw you walk in. Have a seat. Hilary. No, I said Hilarious. Did I say Hilarious? Hilary. What was it? <laughs> Hilary. Okay. I'm getting to know all your names, all right? Love you. Now, so if the Lord is speaking to you, jump in. If you, if, you, if you don't feel that the Lord is speaking to you, fine. There's no pressure. Nobody's going to come to your door. Yanni's not going to call you up. Joni's not going to send you a text and say, where's your faith pledge? We don't do that kind of thing, all right? So we love you and we trust that what God has got for you. See, for non-Christians, they're giving, they're, they're motivated by just saying, I want to be a better citizen in the country. I want to be a nicer human being. I want to help people who are poor. But for us as Christians, our motivation goes deeper. Our motivation goes deeper. And where does it go? Let me read to you the scripture. This is found in uh, 1 John chapter 3, 
verse 16 to 20. Follow with me. This is John writing this, this verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 20. Now, John, when he first started following Jesus, was about 13 to 15 years old. He was the youngest disciple, but he loved Jesus. And Jesus loved this boy who followed him. As you will notice that later on, when Jesus is nailed on the cross, he says to John, John, this is your mother, which was actually Jesus' mother. And he says, Mom, this is your son. All right? John was the only disciple that lived longer than all the other apostles. They all did and gone. Now, decades later, he's a very old man, a man of experience. And so he's writing to the church that's being persecuted and torn apart and all of that. And he writes these words to them and watch what he writes. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but, say it with me, but in deed and in truth. So, for those of us who are Christ followers, I'm sure, put your hand up if, you, if, you, if, the, if this is you, that you know the love of God. He says, for we know the love, because you experienced salvation. You, you felt God protect you, deliver you. You may not have seen it, but you knew somehow, miraculously, God has touched your life. He's put his hand upon you. How many of you can say amen to that? Can I get a witness? Yes. Of course we can. So we know. When people say, how do you know? You say, I know. Deep in my heart, I know. I was down. I was poor. I was broken. I was demonized. I was bound by sin. I was bound by habit. But Jesus set me free. I was lonely. I was depressed. I was on medication. I was on drugs. I was bound by all these kind of things and habits. I was addicted to pornography. I was addicted to all kinds of things that everybody goes through. But Jesus set me free. He says, we know this love. We know this love. For those of us who can say honestly, I know that God loved me. But how else did we know that he loved us? We know that he loves us not only because of what he's done for us, but because he gave himself for us. So in 1 John 3, 16, you read this, right? 1 John 3, 16. What about John, the, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16? All of you can quote that. When you got saved, you memorized that verse. What does it say? John 3, 16 says what? For God, come on, that he gave. For God so loved that he gave. So we find that love and giving goes hand in hand. So in the light of this verse, in verse 16, 1 John 3, verse 16, he says, now brethren, so we ought to, because you know love, and we know that he laid down his life for us, so brethren, we ought to also lay down our lives. For God? Is that what he says? So brethren, we ought to lay down and surrender our lives to God. Is that what he's saying? Now that would be correct if he had said that, but he didn't say that. He said, so we ought to lay down our lives for one another, for our brethren. That completely changes the whole demographics of what we talk love. The church has got no love. You hear some people accuse this church or many churches. Where is the love? Yeah. Come closer, I'll give you some love. We love because we don't just talk love. We are doing the job of love. The very fact that we are existing today, that we show up every Sunday, that we, that we lay down our lives, we're not doing this so that we could get famous, so that we could have a name. God forbid. We do it because we love you. So we don't just say in, in word, but we do it in action. So Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 34, he said, a new commandment I give you. I can imagine all the boys. Says, Jesus is going to be going away. He told them he's going to die. He's going to leave them. I'll send a comforter. And then he sits with them and said, boys, I'm going to give you a new commandment. I know you've had a list of commandments from Moses onward. You grew up in a religious culture and environment. But I'm going to give you a new commandment. And then we're all listening, I can imagine. And he says, now I want you 
to listen carefully. I want you to love one another. And the boys are all like, oh, man, we've heard this before. But he says, no, 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 listen again. I give you a new commandment that you will love one another as I have loved you. It's quite different. Very different. When he raises the standard of love, and what is his standard of love? He gave himself for us. Nobody was too far away, too bad, too wicked for him to say, I'm willing, we sang just now, you were willing to die. You were willing to give up heaven to take our hell. That's how he says, I want you to know what this love I'm talking about. So, let's come to the practical part of it. To give love or to say that we know love is to lay aside our life, our, our, our love and our time and our stuff for others. A couple of months ago, I was with my son-in-law. I surprised them. You know, Stella and I showed up just at Anna's door. Totally shocked them. Should have seen their faces when they came to open the door and saw us standing there. We didn't tell them and so we arrived. <laughs> And I watch my grandkids. At 7 o'clock in the evening, after he sits down, he doesn't crawl about, run about, climb about. He sits down in his chair and he has his meal. And I'm watching this because, I mean, I raised up three girls. They, and I've got, you know, grandsons. <laughs> when we go to a restaurant, they're everywhere. And uh, you've got to hold them down. You've got to literally chain them, handcuff them down. to Sit down, don't walk about, eat your food. But here was... Little Todd sitting down, eating food by himself, and exactly 7 o'clock, he goes upstairs. No fuss, no complaining, no griping. He goes upstairs, and he's put in his little cot. He just lies down there, and he's gone. He sleeps. Gets up the next morning at 7. So I asked my son-in-law and my daughter, how did you do this? I mean, if I, I didn't succeed in that way with my kids. And he said, Papa... Before we had the children, we used to party. I mean, you know Australia. For those of you who know Australia, it's one of the most beautiful places to live and enjoy party life. Some of the best wines, seaside, beautiful. Everything's just gorgeous. He said, for three years, we did that. We just went to work, partied with friends and all of that. When the children came, we decided that we will lay aside our time for the kids. So it was not accidental that these kids are like that. Even the three-month-old little fella, Hendrix, a little baby, they take him upstairs and he grumbles just a little bit, but they don't fuss and bounce. You know, we used to raise children. We bounce them until their brains are all over the place. We, in Malaysia, they have the sarong. You bounce them. Now you've got electronic ones. When you press it, you don't have to bounce anything. We've come in such a crazy... And that thing bounced. That poor child be rocking and we rock them to sleep. And then I'm thinking this not... And the little Hendrix, three months, gorgeous. I want to pick him up. My daughter said, Papa, no, don't touch him. And so she puts him down to bed, and he's out. That's it. No fuss, no nothing, so that we can all come downstairs and have dinner together and play together. That's part of laying aside. Now, Deborah was telling me now many couples are doing that these days, which is fantastic. What is the practical way for us to show love by laying aside something? All right, let's look at verse 17. Here John says, if someone has enough, or if someone has all these worldly goods, nothing wrong, listen, verse 17. There's nothing wrong in, I'm saying to you just now, 2018, God's going to give you some breakthrough, some prosperity, some blessing, some tremendous breakthroughs will happen in the material world as well because God cares about it. He knows you. He, he, knows, all, he knows you like nice stuff and there's nothing wrong in liking nice stuff. But here he tells us, if someone has all these goods, if he has enough, and sees others struggling, but does not respond to that need, how can the love of God be in him? Fair question. So let me talk about enough. It's a subjective term. Because what's enough for me may not be enough for you. Am I correct? So when we read that, we will say, well, that's a loophole. You know, Pastor, this doesn't apply to me because I just don't have, help me, don't have enough. Don't have enough. So John is talking to us about when is enough enough. 
So when he writes this, he says, when you see someone has a need, and we presented the faith pledge, as I said, we don't have to do it. When I go and preach in England and other places in Australia, in fact, I was there recently, they said, why didn't you bring photos of your orphanage? We want to see. I said, I didn't come here to raise fun. As a pastor, I don't raise fun. I raise faith. When your faith is risen and you can trust God, nothing is impossible for this church to do. Amen? So we, we are not on that kind of a mode to try to go to other countries and sell them our sad stories. Our God is the same God who is the God of the UK. In fact, we don't pray our God, our Father who art in UK, hallowed be thy name. No. So when I go and preach in Thailand, I say to them, look, we are your neighbors. You have more freedom in Thailand to preach Christ than we have in our country in Malaysia. So there's no excuse not to build your church rather than sit there and because they have that mentality, you see, the missionary. Our missionaries who are in America, hallowed be thy name. I said, God didn't teach us to pray like that. I'm sorry. It sounds really cruel and hard and unsympathetic. But if you're reading your Bible, this is what he says. He says, when you have these things and you have enough, and while enough is subjective, I want you to stop and think for a while. 10 to 15 years ago, the salary you had was enough 10, 15 years ago. Am I correct? It, it may not be enough now, but I'm saying it was enough those days. Am I correct? I mean, if it wasn't enough, you would be dead. You wouldn't be here today. Am I helping you think? Huh? I want us to think. Everybody do this. Fan yourself a little bit and think. Yeah. Think. Now, today what you're getting may not be enough 15 years from now because the kids are going to grow up, she's going to get a boyfriend, she'll want a new handphone, going to college, she will want all those things that her friends want. The salary you are getting now, Pastor Nays, may not be enough when the little girl turns into one hot chick that's going down, getting, you know, and all that sort of thing, etc., etc. I'm just telling you now because I've been through all that kind of things in my life. Never enough. Am I correct? So enough, everybody say enough, is subjective. 15 years ago, the car I drove won't be enough for today because my guests are large. So I had to get a big car. I don't need a big car, I'm so small. I want a sports car that can get under a lorry when I'm flying through the road, you know. No, but my guests, they come. And not only are they big, their bags are like fridges, refrigerators. So heavy, I've got to throw up. So I needed a bigger car. You understand what I'm saying? The house I used to live in, I'm not dropping names, but this is the truth. The house that I used to live in was enough in those days because my kids were smaller. Now I've got six grandsons. Lord Jesus, help me. So what was enough then is not enough now. You know, I used to have guests from different parts of the world, and I said I'm not name dropping. Brian Houston used to stay in my little cottage house, small house. And he was very humble. He was running Hillsong that, that time already. And he stayed in my house and we, we gave up our, one of our rooms. Our daughters came and jumped into bed with us and he stayed in our guest room. But what was enough then won't be enough now. And what we have now may not be enough for the future. So the question is, when is enough enough? The fact that we can live on some of our margin, I mean, let's face it. Some of you very proudly send on your Instagram and Facebook and you're texting your friends, standing in line, waiting for the latest phone. And you're sending these messages on Instagram on your old phone. You know how hurt your phone feels? <laughs> I just say. But you know, I'm just saying that. How many of you have been to your clothes cabinet, your closet, and you open it up and all those clothes are there and you say, I don't know what to wear. That is a sign that you have abundance. You have abundance. Thank God for that. So the point I'm making is, John is not saying don't have a lot. He's just saying, I'm warning you. He's saying, if you say, like the people in the world, I don't have enough, and some of us have this scarcity mentality. If I don't get that, somebody else might get that. And you are in this, in this panic sit mode all the time. 
John is warning us. He's saying, I need you to be careful. That's how the people in the world think. He says, then how can you say the love of God abides in me? That's the question he throws. The reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I can talk the talk. That's why some people, they, you know, the title of my message is don't talk a good game. How many of you know what, I, what that means? How many of you play sports, basketball, football, uh, any kind of sport? Some of you are pathetic. You don't play any sports that are shocking. And, and you find that people who play in a sport, I mean, I play golf. Those days it was football, etc. So when I play golf, this guy will come up and he'll want to partner with me. And, and you know, I've just met him and he's going to be a partner with him. So I'll say we have a game strategy here. You better play well. And don't worry, bro. And some, you know, when we play golf, everybody's got to put money up front because then after that we're all going to eat and so on and so forth. So that money goes towards that. Don't worry, bro. We'll, we will take them on the first hole. We'll beat them by the seventh hole. We'll do it. And then when he plays, he plays like shoot. <laughs> and I'm looking. And then we come to the, towards the 17th or 18th hole. You're already very down in the game. You can up the game by saying, okay, I'm upping it double. And the dipstick who played like the worst. He, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, bro. I, I, my club, my ball. You're... It's just. So church, John is saying, don't talk a good game. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'll support the church. I'll do this and I'll do that. And you disappear. Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you still like me. I'm not your chubby little Santa Claus. You can come and sit on my lap. So when we talk about love, it's a, where's the love? Pastor Joe, you, 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 you're, you're so strict. You don't love me. Don't love in talk and in words. He says, love Indeed, how can you say the love of God? And this is an old man. John is talking. He's saying, guys, have you, when are you ever going to say, thank God I have enough. Now, I thank God I'm living on a margin. I thank God I can put aside my tithe. I can give towards my building. So this church is a very giving church. You go to many churches, they do not have a regular missions pledge. They do it once a year. They take a missions offering. That's it. We've been doing it for 23 years. I hate you to think that we are trying to squeeze money. I'm just teaching you, because nobody else will teach you, how to be a generous person in 2018. And to watch God fill up all the margins and the empty spaces that, you, that your worldly friends will, will be so fret out and stressed out about how do we get enough. Trust me, God is more than enough. You were singing just now, weren't you? Some of you had your hands up, tears were pouring down your face. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything. And I deliberately told them to choose a song this week. So I want you to mean what you sing for heaven's sake. Just don't sing those words and look spiritual. So when you have a challenge like that that comes up, see, there are a lot of spontaneous giving is good. Random giving is great. See a poor person, they have a need. You go to school, your, your, or your, your, your children come home from school and they say, my friend has got a need and together you all help put money together and help the mother, a single mom. That's fantastic. That's random giving. God bless you for that. Focus giving, where at the end of the year you can see the fruit of it. When you hear testimonies of people getting saved, baptized, being delivered, marriages healed, and you say, my goodness, that fills me up more than anything else. Truly, Christ is enough for me. Truly, this is the best deal. This is the best ride I'm having. This is the best adventure that I'm having because I can see the fruit of what I'm giving. So, fellas like me and many like you, after so many years being in church, walking in church, knowing what's going on, even though we didn't see all that where our money went, we know it went 
And now we see the fruit of these things that are happening. Praise God for that. So John writes to us today, even though it was words that were spoken 2,000 years ago, it's so relevant and applicable today, in a world today where we are so crazy about not having enough. I just don't have, you know, enough is like an appetite. It's never enough. And that's why for those of you who respect your body, there are times where you have to push the food away. It's too much. And you have enough. It's good. It's a good feeling. Because when you walk away from there, you can say, I can go have another meal later. I'm not going to die. But the way some people eat, especially when they go on a buffet, it's like, you know, they, they just pile everything on. I'm not a good buff buffet eater. I, I love a la carte. I just love to a nice, simple meal. A few meals even, I don't mind. But there are some people that walk around. You've seen them, my God, what's wrong with you? You think like it's running out. They'll take everything they can and put it on there and they pile it up right up. And if they go to the salad bar, they'll try to make sure all of them fit to the very end and with the corn right on top. And they sit there and they can't finish the thing. So when are our appetites going to be said and in control? Christ is enough for me. Amen? Is that okay? You received that this Christmas? Yeah. Well, I bring your friends next week. I'm talking about the mess of Christmas, and it's going to be good. So bring your friends next week. Let's stand together. For those of you who have not taken a faith pledge, and you want to be involved in the giving of this faith pledge, that's why it's called a missions thing. It's a, it's a faith thing, all right? Uh, I mean, my wife and I have been doing this for years and years and years, apart from other things. But if you have never been involved in this, it's a faith thing. Everyone can be involved. Uh, just look to one of the, the stewards at the back there. They'll give you a form and a paper so that we can know calculatively what we are doing and how much we're giving and all of that uh, according to your faith. No pressure. We just want you to think about it. So as we sing this song and we worship God one more time in this worship song, after the service, you can go at the back, take out a form. Ask any of those people there, where's the form I'd like to fill in, I'd like to be a part of that. And let me just say, I want to thank God for your generosity. Whatever, like who was saying, Joni was saying, whatever the amount, it's not important. We jumped into an adventure that will bring good and great and mighty results in your private life. So let's listen to the word of God and let's apply the word of God in our lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. Did you receive this today? Yes. Lift your hands up. Father, I receive this word. I thank you, dear God, that your word is always true. You never lie. That you will provide for each and every person. For those who are anxious about visas and jobs, breakthroughs, some are planning for other ventures, starting new jobs, and joining companies. Lord, they might see that there is no stability in this country, there is no stability in this world. But we want to declare as we sing that truly, Jesus, you are more than enough. You are more than enough. And we know that you're going to meet these needs in 2018. You're going to rebuke the devourer over each person's life as they surrender their lives to you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Everybody say it.